I'm Dr. Carrie Horn, author of A Soul Aligned, How God Heals His Creations, and Heart Known Series Workbook, a practical application workbook for biblical healing. In this video, I'd like to talk with you about what it means to be born again. I hear a lot of people using language from scripture incorrectly because they've been taught to do so in counterfeit doctrine and counterfeit Christianity. So we're going to start by looking at all of the contexts with which scripture speaks about born being born again. The first one is in John chapter 3 where Jesus is teaching uh, the Pharisee Nicodemus. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to, the, to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their, de their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Okay, before we move on to the other passage in scripture that talks about being born again, I, we're going to break this down. So Christ says that we have to be born of water and the spirit. We have to be baptized and we have to be born, reborn by the spirit of God. Just because you have been baptized does not mean that you have been reborn by the spirit of God. For those who have been reborn, you will understand this. You will know that you do not just feel like a new creation because you were baptized. So it is incorrect for us to be saying that just because we were baptized means that we were born again. We're not born again when we're baptized. Born again comes from receiving the ministry of God, from demonstrating our faith, from living our faith by receiving the ministry of God. That is how we demonstrate that we actually believe in him. So Jesus is speaking with Nicodemus and he's explaining these things to him. And then he goes on to say some things that seem to have nothing to do with what he's talking about. But Christ isn't, you know, he's not disorganized in his thought process. <laughs> he is saying things that are related, that are connected. So we need to seek to understand that rather than just reading this in a compartmentalized way. Or not understanding certain things and then deciding that you're just going to pick and choose what it is that you understand rather than seeking God on why did he put this in the same passage? Why did Christ speak about this in a continual way? Otherwise, he would have said, I'm talking to you about this. Oh, let me change the subject and talk to you about this. He's not doing that. So we're going to go back to verse 10. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you, 
but still you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? So in speaking of being born again, this is the topic of which they're talking. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? which he's doing right now. He was speaking of a heavenly thing, of heavenly rebirth. We've been born of a woman and now, but in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, we have to be reborn of the spirit. So we were born as man and then we have to be reborn by heaven so that we actually become an earth angel. Our Heart and spirit are of heaven. And I'm going to demonstrate that for you. Not in this passage of scripture. I will demonstrate that for you. For now, keep in mind that when you are reborn, you are reborn of heaven. You are reborn by the spirit, not in the natural sense. So if you are reborn by the spirit, now you have to be an angelic inside. Okay, hang on to that one. I'll come back to it. So he says, I've spoken to you of earthly things and you don't believe. How are you going to believe if I speak to you of heavenly things? How, are you, how can you possibly accept this message that I'm saying to you right now if you don't believe the face valid things? If you don't believe the testimony that we've shared with you? Then he proceeds to say, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Okay, so now he is telling us something about this process of becoming born again, that you must believe that that he's going to be crucified, and anyone who's going to have, who wants eternal life, has to believe in him. Now, up until that point, everyone had believed that it was the law that was going to save them. So he's introducing something. He's saying, I'm going to be raised up just as that the snake was raised up on the pole when, you know, remember that people were sick. And if they focused on that serpent on the pole, they would be, sa- they, they were going to heal. They would be healed. Now, healing and salvation are used synonymously in scripture. So Nicodemus would have understood this if he was given the eyes to see, of course. But he would have understood this language. He would have understood the concept of healing, right? That just as the snake was lifted up, okay, so that should jog his memory that the snake lifted up is associated with being healed. God promised, if you look at the snake, focus on the snake, on the, on the pole, you will be healed. So what are we told? If you focus on Christ and you believe in him and you believe what God has told you, that this is the Messiah who he sent to save us, you will be healed. You will have eternal life in him. That sounds a little like salvation to me. Doesn't it sound like salvation to you? Then he goes on to say, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So Christ is now telling Nicodemus, here's what God did. This Messiah that he promised has come into the world. That is what I'm going to be doing. I am going to be sacrificing for you and for all those who believe in me. Now, just because Moses lifted up that pole with the snake on it did not mean that everyone who was in the vicinity was healed. 
did it. Only those who focused on it and believed that God would heal them were healed. Just because you are in the vicinity of what Christ has done does not mean that you will be healed unless you believe. And then Christ goes on to talk about the fruit of those who believe. Everyone who does evil hates the light. So he has come into the world. But those who are avoiding him, those who are not following him, they are, try- they are avoiding the light because they don't want their evil deeds to be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. They are not living in shame. They feel godly grief. When they feel that godly grief, they go to God, they repent. They are blameless in God's sight, not because they're perfect. They're blameless because they're going back to God and they're doing what he has commanded, returning to him and he returns to them and they are healed. That is the life that people live who have been born again. Now I want to show you another passage in scripture. Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. This is the process by which we are reborn. No longer do we have a hardened heart, a heart of stone that has been defiled by the world that heart is removed and a softened heart is placed in us and God's spirit is placed in us. And he begins to move us to follow his decrees and be careful to keep his laws. I know a lot of people who refer to themselves as being reborn and they are not living this out. I don't see the fruit of that. I see other fruit that is not of God. That's called discernment, not judgment. I'm testing the spirit in that person to see whether they are from God, whether they have been born of heaven, reborn by the spirit, are they of God based on the fruit they bear? If you're still able to watch your old shows and listen to your old music and live your old life and not be grieved and not be moved to return to God, to repent of that, to be changed, to be on an upward trajectory of growth, you're not in him, plain and simple. And I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm not saying that to be judgmental. It's not a judgment. It's a discernment. I'm saying it because love speaks the truth. And there is no love in counterfeit Christianity that entices and condones you all the way to hell. You have to be changing. Here's the good news is that if you're not right now, then pray and ask God to turn your heart. Ask him to show you what this is. Ask him to teach you how to receive this because he has promised that those who come to him, who call on him, who believe in him, he will not turn them away. Those who actually believe in him and call on the name of the Lord are going to be saved. And in order to truly call on him, you have to believe. And in order to believe, you have to truly call on him and receive him. Now, I know a lot of people who pray all day long with many words, but they're not hearing from God. That is problematic. If you're not hearing from God, you need to close your mouth and open your heart. Your words are not going to justify you. Your heart is going to justify you. So as it's written, if you hear his voice today, don't harden your heart as our ancestors did in the rebellion. Return to him enter his rest. Otherwise, there's going to come a time when you cannot enter his rest at all. Now I'm going to start reading in 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to start at uh, chapter 13, excuse me, verse 13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting wording, isn't it? I'm going to read it again. With minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. When is grace brought? When Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. So all those who are saying you're already saved, you need to reconsider what you are saying. 
We are working out our salvation. We are working out the covenant that we've made with God. And we are setting our hope on the grace that's going to be brought to us when Christ is revealed at his coming. Now, from the perspective of Peter, Christ had already come, so he can't be talking about the first time he came. He's talking about the next time he comes, when he comes to gather his people during the first resurrection. That is when salvation will be fulfilled. That is when those who have fulfilled their covenant with Christ will experience and participate in the first resurrection and in the fulfillment of salvation. That is when we will receive grace. Until then, we're working out our covenant. And it is a requirement that we be reborn. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Now Peter is talking about how we work out this covenant. So we do not conform to the evil desires we had when we lived in ignorance. But we have to conform to something. And as it is, he's telling us that we have to be conformed to Christ. That we have to become holy as he is holy. So verse 14, he says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. So now we are children, first of all, We've been engra- we have been engrafted, we've been adopted into sonship through Jesus Christ. We are children of his father. So if we are obedient children, we can't conform to the evil desires we had previously when we lived in ignorance. So now there's an implication that we are living in truth, that we are living with awareness. And just as he said in the previous verse, fully sober and alert. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. That was a commandment that was commanded of us all the way back to Deuteronomy. Be holy as God is holy. For it is written, oh, well, there it is. Be holy because I am holy. Verse 17. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Well, what does that mean? Foreigners where? Foreigners here on earth. We don't belong to this earth. If we have been born, reborn by the spirit, reborn of heaven, that's our home. We're foreigners here. And we are to live in reverent fear, reverent fear of God, reverent fear of being separated from God, reverent fear of disobeying God. Because we know that if we obey, we are blessed. And if we disobey, we are punished. It's very clear in Leviticus 26, verse 18. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. So how have you been purified? By obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. We have to obey. Another contingency of our covenant. We have to obey. And not just when we heard his voice in the beginning, just when he was doing for us, just when he was revealing himself to us, we have to obey all the way to the end. We have to endure till the end. If you don't see that in scripture, Google it. Google endure till the end and then with the word Bible and you'll see the verses that come up around that. So don't Google it so that Google tells you or so that someone's sermon tells you, look it up in the word of God. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Okay, so... He is telling us 
that this is the fruit. So he's not telling everybody in the vicinity, right? Like we talked about with the previous scripture, he's not talking about everyone who's in the vicinity, everyone who's in a counterfeit church. He's speaking to people who he sees are bearing the fruit. He's already talked about the fruit. That previously you lived in ignorance, now you're living in truth. That you must obey. That you must not conform to the evil desires when you lived in ignorance. That you must become holy. That your faith and hope must be in God. Not in medicine, not in science, not in money, not in whatever else. There cannot not be any other God before him. Your faith and hope must be in God. That you must be purified by obeying the truth so that then you are bearing the fruit of sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. And then he says, you've been born again, not of perishable seed. So not by man or woman. Woman is the only one who can give birth, contrary to the weird stuff that's being introduced in our culture today. You have been reborn by imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. So now he reminds them, you've heard this before. This is the truth that you accepted. Now I told you earlier that I was going to talk about what it is to what it actually, what it means to be reborn of heaven, to be reborn by the spirit. And I am going to refer to a sermon um, because I feel I have discerned that this is put together very well, and I do believe it to be true. And you can discern it yourself. You can look up these words just as I did. Um, but I am going to give credit to the person who wrote the sermon. This is not a person I endorse. I've heard him say a lot of things that I do not agree with. I've seen that he associates himself with satanic exploitative systems such as TBN. I've seen him doing interviews with satanic preachers such as Kenneth Copeland. So I do not endorse this person, but I have discerned this message to be true. And I do believe that there are some messages that he does speak that are true, but there are all, there's also stuff that's sprinkled in there that demonstrates to me that there is a lack of wisdom. So I'm just going to be upfront about that because I refuse to associate myself with man, but I do discern this teaching to be true based on the translations of the text in Hebrew and Greek. I do believe this message is true. So that said, in his book, The Book of Mysteries, Jonathan Kahn explained that there are warring angels and there are ministering angels and there are also earth angels. The word for the angel of the Lord in Hebrew is malak. In the New Testament, the word used for the messenger of the Lord is the Greek word angelos. So Haggai was referred to the Lord, uh, referred to as the Lord's malak because he was the Lord's messenger or angel. And likewise, John the Baptist was the one who heralded the Messiah. In Matthew eleven ten, 10, the scripture says, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger, my angelo, ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. So an earth angel is a messenger who is sent by God on divine assignment. They're not of this world, but they're delivering a message to the world. These angels are those who are born again. When we are reborn to God and adopted into sonship through Jesus Christ, we become born again through the ministry of God's Holy Spirit, what he's doing with us, how he's changing us when he removes our heart of stone and he places a new heart within us and his Holy Spirit in our hearts. And that is done for those who truly believe, who hear his voice and don't reject him, who truly believe and continue in that way, that we're God proves himself to us, we come to believe, and then we prove ourselves to him through fulfilling the covenant. That is the process. If that's not happening or hasn't happened in you, if it has happened in you, you know what I'm talking about. If it hasn't happened in you, you need to receive it. You need to pray for it 
and you need to receive it single-mindedly, not double-mindedly, single-mindedly you receive that. So the message we deliver is the good news or gospel of Christ, which is the word evangel in Greek, from which we get the word evangelism or Eve angelism. We bear the divine message to those on earth. We are here on divine assignment in the world, but not of the world. We live on mission for the kingdom of heaven. We are not our own. We belong to the God of heaven. We are God's messengers and witnesses. And there is a clear difference between the spirit in us and the spirit in those who have not been reborn by God. Now, usually... I do not read from anything or prepare anything, but that is a was a passage from A Soul Aligned, so I'm reading from it. So I think that's kind of a cool thing. I love being able to understand the Hebrew and Greek origins of the text because there's some things that we just can't get from English. We have to understand the origins of the text. So I also encourage you to do that if you're reading scripture and like you're not understanding something or even if the Holy Spirit just convicts you, like prompts you and says, look up the the context of this word, look it up. Um, I typically use blue letter Bible for that. I find that to be just an easier way of looking up like the tools and stuff like that. But even as I use blue letter Bible, sometimes I don't feel that I'm really getting the full um, translation. And so I'll even look it up. I'll take like the word, you know, Malak, for example. If I see that on Blue Letter Bible, I'm going to see what they have to say, but I'll even, you know, type it in, um, uh, Malak in Hebrew, and I'll look at what kind of the background is of that word. My family's from Argentina, so they speak Spanish. And in Spanish, we have a lot of words like that too, where um, there is just no, there's no like direct English translation. You have to understand the context of the word within the native language. So now remember that within the context of having been reborn, Peter is telling the people that they have to live as obedient children, that they have to become holy as God is holy. And God speaks to us in a way that we can understand. We understand what it is to be a child of someone. We understand what it is to have been born of a woman. And remember that he has designed us according to his will, according to what he wants to teach us, and according to the end game for God, right? And the end game is that he wants us to be healed. He wants us to be his children. He wants us to be saved. So he has designed us in such a way and speaks to us in such a way that we will understand spiritual things. So he calls us children, He says that we are adopted into sonship through Jesus Christ. That is how we become his children. If we believe in him, we will obey. If we obey, we will listen. We will seek him. We will receive his ministry. We will be changed. And we will become adopted into sonship through that process of rebirth, of becoming reborn. Because as natural children, we came from our mothers. But as spiritual children, we come from the spirit. We are born from the spirit. We become transformed by the one to whom we are conformed. Similarly, If we are conformed to the spirit of the enemy, if we are conformed to evil, as Peter talked about, he said, don't become, don't be conformed to evil as you were previously when you were living in ignorance. But those who are conformed to evil become sons and daughters of the devil. They become children of the devil. And remember that Christ said, you're children of the devil. Your desire is to do his desires, to execute his desires. So on the other side, If we're children of God, what are our desires? To do his desires. And I don't hear any option there, any option for us to do our own desires. We're either crucified of ourselves and now living for Christ or Christ living in us, or we're living for evil. We cannot be reborn if we're still living for self. And you saw within the passage that I just read, 
that the trans there is an association of being reborn and being God's messenger. And that absolutely stands on scripture, doesn't it? We have to be sharing our testimonies. We have to be used by him. We were set aside, set apart for a purpose. That purpose has to be activated. We have to receive that purpose through him. We have to maintain connection to the vine in Jesus Christ. And guess what? We have to be hearing from him in order to do any of those things. I hear a lot of the time, I hear people say, I don't hear from God the way that you do. And I realize that God speaks to us, may speak to us according to the purpose for which he has set us apart. Don't let that be an excuse for you. Don't let that be a stumbling block to you that you don't hear in the same way that I hear. You need to seek to hear. And I'm going to tell you one of the things that I do that is critical, that it's not just something that I'm required to do. It's something all of us are required to do. We are required to afflict ourselves with fasting. That's a requirement. We are supposed to be withholding from ourselves fasting and returning to him. We're supposed to be returning to him and resting in him consistently one day a week. And on a specific day, not just on any day that we choose, on Sabbath. And the reason why we do that is we are supposed to withhold from ourselves in order to discipline our flesh, our physical flesh, our body and our mind. And we are supposed to circumcise from the sinful flesh, from any of the, for example, distractions that we've been engaging in that we fell into during the week. And so having this one day a week where we're doing this keeps us in check. It keeps us on the path. It's it's not to be used for the purpose of I'm going to obey the Sabbath and then I'm going to go back to the vomit. No, if you're truly obeying Sabbath and you're resting in him and you're rending your heart to him and you're returning to him in any ways that you've strayed, that is going to become a sort of a checks and balances so that when you go back to work and you're doing these things that you ha- that you do on a daily basis that you know what it feels like to be in him so that you're not letting the tentacles of the flesh grab you back again now in terms of fasting i'm with god every day i'm with him every day every morning that i get up that is the first thing that i do is sit with him and still it's not enough. It is not enough for me to just sit and pray. I have to make sure that I'm in the right posture. I have to make sure that I am weak. God has afflicted me in order to make me weak. He has given me certain things. You know, I've shared in other videos that there are certain foods that I I have to eat like a very regimented way or I get sick. And the reason why is because God wants me I shouldn't use the word sick. I should say, otherwise I don't feel so well because there is a there is a difference between having a thorn or an affliction that God is using to move you and to keep you close versus being sick. Sick was when I was breaking out in welts from head to toe and open wounds all over my body. That was sick. Okay, so I want to make that distinction and I'm not even going to edit this because I think it's important that I made that kind of um, slip in my speech so that you understand the difference between sick and afflicted. Affliction is important. It is important that we are afflicting ourselves with fasting. Now, let me tell you something. There's a lot of spins on affliction, aren't there? You got the Catholic church telling you that you got to flog yourself and do all of these crazy things. That's nowhere in scripture. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about afflicting ourselves with fasting, which is in the Bible, That language is in the Bible. And the reason I'm talking about that is because when we are afflicting ourselves with fasting, when we're bringing ourselves low, we are indeed disciplining our physical flesh, circumcising from our worldly desires for self. And we're bringing ourselves into position to actually hear and receive God. And the reason God keeps me in this position and requires me to be disciplined and requires me to move slowly 
because I can't move quickly if I'm in this position. I can't just do whatever I want to do like I did previously in my life. I can't eat whatever I want, be hedonistic, indulge my, my flesh desires. He doesn't let me live that way anymore. Why? Because he said that when we're reborn, he removes our heart of stone, places a new softened heart in us and places his spirit in us and he will move us to follow his laws and keep his decrees. He's going to move us according to his will, not our own. So if that means that he's got to put us in a position where we can't move as quickly, we can't be distracted, we can't multitask, we can't eat all of the stuff that we used to eat because otherwise it's going to become a distraction. Otherwise it's going to carry us away in the flesh. That's what he's going to do. And it's not because he gives grief willingly. It's because he loves us. It's because we have to be in that posture and in that submitted, slowed down, prudent position in order to be in him, in order to actually do what he has called us to do, in order for him to enact the purpose for which he set us apart. So does this happen just because you were baptized? Absolutely not. You were baptized by obedience. It was a declaration of your faith. People are at all different stages of their faith when they're baptized. It is a requirement to be baptized in the Bible. So if you've not been baptized, please do that. Please get baptized. I personally do not believe that you have to be baptized by man. We're living in such a horrible time of wickedness right now. Who is man? Who is man that he can even baptize? It's the spirit of God that is baptizing you. In Mark eleven thirty, 30, when Christ is talking with the apostles about John the, Baptist, John the Baptist, he says, John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? Tell me. So there is, baptism is not from hum, human origin. Baptism is from heaven. So if you've not been baptized and you don't know anyone who is able to do that with you, then do it between you and God. God wants us to participate as the church. He wants us to assemble. He wants us to lay hands. He wants us to pray with each other and worship together. But if you don't have the ability to do that, just as there are people across this world who don't have religious freedom to gather, does that make them any less part of the church? No, because true believers worship God in truth and in spirit. This is between us and God. It's not between us and man, though he would like for us to share that with one another. It has become less and less available to us due to the increase in wickedness in this world. So baptism is a requirement, but you don't need any special church or water or anything else that comes from man. You only need God. God has not exempt anyone who loves him from salvation. But I want you to remember and be very clear in your understanding that just because you've been baptized does not mean you're saved. It doesn't mean you're part of the church. And it doesn't mean that you have been reborn. Being saved, we are working out our covenant with God and we will be saved what did I say? When Christ comes, that's when we will receive grace if we have fulfilled that covenant. Being reborn means that you are actually being changed. You are being moved by God's spirit. If that's not happen happening, you've not been reborn and you need to pray for that because that is the only way that you're going to get into the kingdom of heaven. And lastly, we're told in John 4, 22 through 24, that true worshipers must worship God in truth and in spirit. These are the worshipers that the Father desires. So please don't think that you need to find a church because churches are full of satanic doctrine and more and more in the times that we're living in. God desires true worshipers who worship him in the truth and in his spirit. And while God tells us that he does want us to assemble some people don't have that religious freedom. And at this point in history, it's really difficult to find other people who actually 
have the faith that they claim to have. There's a lot of wickedness in this world. So just because you may not be able to assemble doesn't mean you're not part of the church. And likewise, just because you're in a mega church surrounded by a bunch of people who claim to believe doesn't mean that there's a single person in that church who believes or who is part of the church. So please understand these things. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this video has been helpful and edifying. Please leave comments and questions if you have any. And God bless you. I'll see you in the next video.